first installment, the focus of the discussion is on how to connect evangelical Christians and conservative Muslims. Bob Roberts is founder and senior pastor of Northwood Church in Keller, Texas. As an evangelical pastor with experience in working with Muslims in places like Palestine and Afghanistan, Roberts argues that there is no need to increase efforts at bringing moderate Christians and Muslims together in interfaith dialogue, since this is already being done, and most of these groups agree anyway. Instead, he believes, there is a need to bring together conservatives of different faiths in multi-faith joint social activities. Discussing the limits of traditional interfaith dialogue, Bob Roberts shows how true dialogue starts with the hand rather than with a discussion over values. You know, when you have two different groups or two or more different groups with different value systems, how do you go about it? Because, as you were pointing out there, but I'd like you to repeat and expand on that, trying to convince the other of changing their value system is not going to work. So many normal practitioners would just say, well, we just don't deal with it. I would say a couple of things. I would say uh, the first thing that you you want to do, you want to get those who are diametrically opposed to the table together. Yep. It doesn't do any good for people who agree. So what's happening right now on the whole Christian Muslim issue is generally more liberal or more mainline Christians that are having conversations with Muslims. Some of these Muslims would be, in, in their own words, consider themselves as more moderate uh, and, and so forth. My concern is the biggest point of conflict is between the evangelical and the more conservative Muslim. And so how do you get them at the table? Traditionally, uh, we bring pastors and imams together and say we have different worldviews, but we have many things in common and similar. See, can't we all get along? Exactly. It just doesn't work. There's a lot of frustration. They start talking theology. Uh, Each... Uh, will lob criticisms of the other, why don't you do this, why don't you do that, and so it leads to nowhere. Yep. So what, what I've discovered is, and this is what I experienced when our church began to work in Vietnam, that you know we weren't there to talk theology with the Vietnamese government. What we did was we started with just working in the city. And so where, where were things that, that needed to be healed that we could both benefit from, and how did we come together? So from that, our premise is you start with the hand. Because generally people will come together and collaborate on common interest. So, you know, if we collaborate on our public schools, government, taxes, everything else in society, the economy, and yet we don't collaborate on faith as a basis for the healing of the city, that's absurd. Yep. And so what can we agree upon that needs to be done? So it starts with the hand. As we start working with the hand, whether it's rebuilding houses, cleaning up parks, working in public schools, uh, it doesn't matter. Then what happens is our heart is connected, and we begin to trust the other, we begin to share with the other, and then finally when we get to that point, then we're ready to have conversations about where we agree and disagree. What you've done is this. Yep. you built up trust and relationship before you have conversation. The other way, what you're doing is you're starting with conversation without trust and without relationship. And you have two opposite views of who God is, and you're not going to come together on the basis of your agreement with God. So that's how you do it. Let me insert this before I forget. Yeah. I also think one of the critical issues here is more of a perspective of having a multi-faith conversation versus an interfaith conversation. Interfaith has been driven more by moderates, mainline, and liberals, and that's why most evangelicals aren't going to have that conversation. They don't want to compromise on their theology. They don't want to say they agree for the sake. Whereas if I say, look, we fundamentally disagree over who we understand Jesus to be, but what you believe about Jesus And what I believe about Jesus, in terms of him engaging the city, helping people, he did that. So let's come together on that one basis and not try to agree theologically. And and why multi-faith, just as a term? If you use interfaith in a Western context, it's viewed as a watering down of what Christians believe, uh, evangelical Christians believe about who Jesus is and what they believe about what he said about knowing him. It also can communicate that to some imams 
Uh, the majority of imams that I know are, are fairly conservative yep. in, in what they believe. There may be moderate Muslims. I think most imams are more more uh, Quranically trained, and they hold tighter to the text. Yep. And I would I would say, which is true of Christians. Yep. And I would say what is true for uh, Muslims in mass. And, and the reason you want those imams and those pastors together is this. This is huge. They are gatekeepers to their congregations. See, what you're really after is not the imam and the pastor. Yep. What you're after is the masses in those congregations of getting them connected. But, but what's the, I mean, stupid question, but why do you want to connect them? For the good of the city and, and, and the good of the world. Because the reality is, there was a time when religion and faith was geographical and tribal. Yep. That time no longer exists. Yep. Every religion is everywhere, and it's going to only continue to be so. Muslims aren't going away, and neither are Christians. If we don't resolve our differences, or at least learn how to build a city together, we're going to destroy one another. We're not going to trust one another. We're going to live with constant tension, fear. It leads to, you know, even violence. And so in the past, because religion and faith was something that was tribal and geographical, I could choose to ignore the person on the other side of the world. Yep. <clears throat> I, can't, I can't do that anymore. And the problem is we have a new world with an old way of relating to one another, and it's just not functional. Okay. But, but still, you're driving, you know, some, some people may see, well, maybe your hidden agenda is just to do something good so that you can afterwards change their values. I mean, how, how do you make sure you're not misunderstood in your social activities? I think it all starts with relationship. But here's the thing, Simon, right up front, I tell people, I am a Christian. I'm an evangelical Christian. I want the whole world to know about Jesus. Here's what I would say is where I'm different from some evangelicals. Number one... If a person, let, let's say a person says, well, great, but I never want that. Yep. I'm still going to be in relationship with them. Yeah. Because I have a responsibility to do that according to the Bible, according to what Jesus teaches. So I think the key is you've got to be up front with your agenda. What you're asking is a very critical question. If I come, and this is why I like multi-faith and not interfaith. If I come across with with you know, oh, look at all the things we agree on, and, and we really are so similar, it's no big deal. Then when we get to the hard questions and discussion, it's as, e as if I've been, in my opinion, deceptive yep. about who I am and what I believe, and I've not been up front. Yep. So I want them to know up front. So I, I would say to you, my agenda is, here, here's my agenda, to love God and love people. To love God is about my personal walk with Christ. To love people is serve them in the name of Christ. So, you know, we have a, a saying in our church, and I, I wrote a whole chapter in a book on this. Serve not to convert, but serve because you're converted. And so what, what that means is conversion is something that God does. Yeah. Not anything that we can do. So we can share. We can serve. We should never push. We should never pressure. We should serve and just naturally talk about our faith. And that cuts two ways. Mm -hmm. That means a Muslim gets, gets to do that as well. But it, it's not like you're sitting down and having theological discussions. Now let's go through this text and that text and this position. You're building a relational model. Yep. And so you're basically driven by the realization you know, as you said, it's no longer geographically isolated, so we, we have to learn how to get on. Exactly. And it, it's basically also a nonviolence as your, your approach. You're not pushing, you're, you just want to serve a social good, whoever denomination is in it. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. Because what happens is, if my only motive becomes, I've got to get you to agree with my religion and, and become the follower that I am, we're never going to get along. Yeah. It's just not going to happen because... We're going to be in head-to-head -head confrontation. But that doesn't mean that the Muslims should not practice the Dawah or yeah. the Christians should not practice the Great Commission. That's not the question. The question is, how is it practiced? And in the past, I mean, where 
just like we're talking by phone now. I mean, people talk through Skype, the Internet, everything else. In the past, faith was a presentation of a belief system. Yep. I think what it's going to have to come to is not just the belief system, but how we relate to one another. And that's what's not been developed. How do we of uh, different faiths relate to one another? And, and you're saying the, the one way you've chosen is really to get engaged in, in social activities together? It is, because we can all agree we 